today I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Chang Hoon again. So Chang is uh, uh, a student of Jennifer Rexford. He graduated from Princeton. And since then, he's been working on a lot of projects related to data centers and network virtualization. I'm sure many of you would have read the, the VL2 paper in SACOM. So it was, uh, I mean, Chang did a lot of work on VL2. Uh, and he's going to talk about how uh, Microsoft is managing their data centers and uh, uh, how are they are operating at scale. Thanks, Chang. Thank you, Bima, for introduction. Thank you, Yanis, for uh, organizing this. Should I be wearing a microphone or something like that, or is no. it just fine? No, no, okay. it's fine. Great. So, uh, I'm Chang, and uh, today I'm going to talk about network virtualization for large data centers. A lot of these technologies and architectures are, of course, also useful for enterprise networks. Uh, I'm currently at Windows Azure. I was at uh, Microsoft Research formerly. So, the other day, a friend of mine just asked me this quite casually <laughs> this question, and then um, as a data center researcher, I pretty much knew that you know, almost all the bytes are coming from data centers these days. Uh, but thanks to the How Much Information project by UCSD, uh, I now have good numbers. So, um, basically, data centers produce the bytes, internet and CDN disseminate the bytes, and the devices around us consume the bytes. That's the way it goes. And data centers are indeed running all sorts of applications today. Search, email, social networking, cloud computing, um, you know, data mining, um, high performance computing, and even online games today. So uh, it's no wonder that data centers are proliferating. So this picture shows the um, data center build-out plan of a few largest online service companies just this year only. And that it's not these IT giants who are building data centers. Most large enterprises have their own separate, but not maybe not physically separate data centers. And then worldwide you have some hundreds of thousands of data centers today. And a data center size is today usually determined by the electrical power and econom economies of scale, and it's between somewhere around you know, 50 to 200,000 servers. So data centers are you know, the IT era analog of factories, <coughs> producing bytes rather than goods. And factories are expensive to build and run, and so are data centers. So suppose you have a small data center composed of just maybe 50,000 servers. This would be your monthly bill. If only you were able to pay monthly. The truth is that only power consumption is used to pay, and you have to pay all the other things upfront, costing some hundred million dollars every three years. And hence this golden rule. Let's maximize the amount of useful work per dollar spent. You have already spent the money, so let's make the best out of it. And to abide by this golden rule, data center providers and tenants are usually adopting two best operating principles. First, multi-tenancy, time and space sharing. To keep all these servers as busy as possible, these servers are divided up on, among a large number of tenants. And second, dynamic resizing. To, uh, to, avoid, uh, to, to avoid squandering servers and yet obtain them when needed, is, uh, the tenants are usually adjust their server pool sizes dynamically, up and down. And um, to support these key operating principles, what is most important, uh, the most important technological uh, mechanism or architecture in data center is agility, which I define as a capability to assign any servers to any tenants anytime. And in fact, systems research communities made huge progress, especially towards agility these days, Machine and switch virtualization are great examples. Unfortunately, the network falls short in several aspects. So let's see why. So this is a brief explanation of the conventional data center network architecture. So this is a hierarchy of switches and routers reaching from the racks of servers at the bottom to the core routers connecting this data center to other data centers or the internet. Okay. Um, Ethernet technology is quite uh, popular because it essentially allows self-configuring. But uh, to enable self-configuring, Ethernet heavily relies on broadcasting and flooding, and so it doesn't scale very well. So 
to scale well to host up to hundreds of thousands of servers, data center providers usually build a large number of small subnets corresponding to Ethernet VLANs, and then connect these VLANs using IP routing technology. And IP routing technology, as you will, as you may well know very well, um, uses location dependent addressing, meaning that if a server belongs to one subnet, it cannot use the other subnet's address prefix. So, and I'll soon tell you that why this location dependent addressing is very bad in a data center. A cluster is a server management unit typically composed of one or two thousand servers, uh, responding to a few Ethernet VLANs or subnets. And um, this architecture has been around since early 2000s when data centers were predominantly hosting you know, web services. Uh, nowadays, web services are you know, stories of the past. So we have some huge problems here. So one central problem of this architecture is that it depends on high-cost mainframe-style network devices, uh, something like this, the upper layer. So these devices are usually used in the large ISPs to meet their huge capacity and reliability requirements. And these devices have loads of unneeded hardware and software features, especially for data center. For example, the the packet buffer, which is needed to cope with uh, huge end-to-end -end latency happening only in the internet, but in data centers, latency is always, almost always less than one, mic one millisecond. So th that kind of feature is uh, almost never used. Um, but in the absence of reliable alternatives, in the early days, data center providers just ended up buying a small number of those high-end devices, and then uh, wound up creating hugely oversubscribed network. And this oversubscription causes a lot of problem when it meets with today's traffic demand. Today's data center applications are highly distributed, almost embarrassingly distributed style, uh, like MapReduce, distributed blob storage, um, you know, distributed in-memory caching, and etc. So these kind of applications usually drive a huge amount of intra-data center traffic, also known as east-west traffic, and then you have some serious problems. So what are those problems? The consequence is poor agility. So let's, let me give you an example. Suppose you have two tenants, blue and orange, each given servers in cluster A and B respectively. Now the blue tenant just needs a new server because one of its servers has just failed. Right? Now the provider has an available, some available servers in cluster B, so it wants to assign one available server to the blue tenant. But doing this causes a lot of problems. First, this limited cross-cluster bisection bandwidth will damage the performance of the blue service. It's going to be especially helpful if blue is running some distributed applications such as MapReduce because the other blue servers with relatively more network capacity will end up wasting their own CPU cycles and memory while waiting for the completion of this particularly slower networking job exercising this poor path. Okay. And the orange tenant will also get collateral performance damage. And also, since this is a replacement server, the blue tenant would naturally want to use the IP address of the old server that this new server is replacing. But unfortunately, and, but using this, um, the same address is particularly important because it minimizes service disruption by avoiding changes to the application state or configuration. Unfortunately, this data center architecture does not support location independent addressing and hence this new server has to get a new IP address. So what happens is that the provider usually confines each tenant within a strict boundary cluster or it just spreads a tenant servers widely across data centers and force the tenant to painfully swallow this huge performance variance and address changes, frequent address changes. Either way, waste of resources inevitable, lowering data center utilization significantly. So given all these limitations of the sort of almost decade old networking architecture, data center providers and tenants have been using a lot of retrofitting, uh, deploying a lot of retrofitting solutions. For example, they try to distribute uh, virtual machines or jobs uh, over an optimal set of servers chosen based on network performance of topology so that they can maximize the amount of work done per unit time. 
uh, given an oversubscribed network, they also try to do traffic engineering so that they can adjust traffic forwarding path for the dominant um, tenants. Uh, and, and doing so will hopefully uh, ensure or increase the effective network capacity useful for the dominant tenant. Um, there are indeed a plethora of such, a, such approaches uh, which essentially try to outmaneuver the existing problems in the underlying layer with limited information and features available at the layers above the network. So sometimes it can work well, sometimes it might not work well because suppose you have came up with the optimal routing solution for a particular tenant or for the current snapshot, by the time you have generated and deployed that new solution, the network state might have already changed it, making that solution no more optimal. On the other hand, we really haven't spent a lot of time to actually eliminate this underlying problem completely. Okay, so my research for the past few years has been precisely focusing on this drastically different approach uh, by presenting fundamentally new network architectures that support agility at scale in the first place. And uh, I argue that network virtualization as an architectural principle achieved this uh, ambitious goal and I'll show you that turning those architectures into operational systems is quite possible as well. So before moving into the solution space, let me articulate the, uh, the goal. What do, what do I mean by support for agility in the context of networking? So agility <coughs> means that, suppose you're a tenant, your servers will be disseminated widely across in a data center. And in that situation, what you want is a technology that helps you stop caring about the placement of your servers. And I turn this high-level goal into three specific technical requirements. First, I want to assign any IP address to any servers. With this, your servers can use the same persistent IP addresses even when they get replaced with new ones. If yours, yep. So, isn't, I mean, isn't it the persistent IP address problem? Yep. Doesn't that indicate that they're sort of a, or sort of a problem with the way applications are designed like like for example my um, yep. my my computer doesn't care like which USB port I plug my keyboard in I don't care which DRAM chip my my right. my program right. uses right it right. seems that this is not this is a problem in the way applications are designed that they don't respond that basically they have to have this low level this address which course this you know, sort of low-level knowledge of the network, and if that their IP address changes, then they break. Some applications, some new applications, are actually exactly designed that way, so that they can absorb the underlying changes. Stateless applications uh, do that. If you are a group of, if you have an army of you know software engineers who are well trained, you can build your applications actually that way. Bing does that. Google does that. All these big application guys do that. Existing applications using existing libraries and OS, they just want to simply migrate their existing binaries from enterprise to to the cloud. Those things can easily fail. Yeah. Yep. I have a response for your observation. I don't think that application, you know, so application really deal with IP address. They deal, and most they deal with, you know, so URL and that kind of thing. IP address is more operating system. Issue and, and even the TCP stack has the, you know, the under, fundamental underlying assumption that the IP addresses on both ends will remain the same. If it changes, it just totally goes TCP state machine. So, uh, if your VMs are, uh, if your servers are actually virtual machines, with this feature, you can, and along with uh, for light migration, you can actually preserve ongoing connections and ensure service continuity. You can also assign the same address prefix for all your servers, regardless of where they are, and that can make your application and service management extremely simple. Second, I want to offer high networking performance between any pairs of servers in this data center. With this, you can actually enjoy consistency of the performance. And why is this good? Because you don't need to worry about the wasted CPU and memory uh, because you know these servers, other servers just don't need to worry about particularly slow networking jobs between two distant servers. And also, um, with this, you can make your job placement or you know VM placement algorithms very simple. And finally, 
I just want to protect tenant from one another. With this, I can remain carefree even when my servers are located right next to my competitor servers or even malicious servers. So these are the three key goals, which I call as abstraction and isolation and efficiency. So uh, this is the summary of my network virtualization project. Um, so I began with VL2. VL2 is precisely about offering this huge virtual switch abstraction to all the tenants within the same data center. So forget about this highly oversubscribed <coughs> location dependent network architecture. I just want to give them a huge layer to switch. And tenants just can move around, they can repurpose servers. I, I don't care because this switch offers flat addressing and uniform high capacity, just like physical switch. And then I extended this abstraction in the uh, two other, uh, actually a few other <coughs> projects, VNet and Seawall, and IQ is another project that I've been doing with uh, Balaji and Dave and um, Vimal here. So instead of having just one huge shared switch, let's just give one individual switch, a virtual switch with unlimited capacity to every single tenant. So each tenant can have <coughs> as many ports on this switch as they wish. And then they have complete isolation in terms of addressing, in terms of reachability, and also in terms of performance. So I'm going to talk about VL2 and VNet in this talk, and I'll be happy to talk about Seawall and IQ offline. So this is basically a single slide summary of my, what my network virtualization architectures specifically do and how. So first, flat addressing. So the reason why conventional networks cannot ensure flat addressing is because they assign just one IP address <coughs> per server. Okay? And that IP address works both as a name and location identifier. I solve this problem just simply by assigning two addresses or two identifiers to each server, one working as an invariable name, invariant name, and the other working as a variable location identifier. And, and I introduce a simple address translation and resolution mechanism working between these two types of identifiers. And second, uniform high capacity. Again, the reason why conventional network cannot ensure uniform high capacity easily is because they're oversubscribed. And my data center measure and reserves indicate that optimizing your routing, especially in data center on this oversubscribed network, might not lead to huge benefit. It may lead to some benefit, some cases, but not great, you know, game-changing benefit. So my approach is just you know, building a bottleneck-free network that ensures oversubscription-free capacity under any traffic pattern. And let's just forget about optimization. That's my approach. And of course, the key question is whether this is feasible in practice. And my core contribution is that, yes, it is indeed feasible if you use a certain type of topology and an oblivious routing mechanism called Bayesian load balancing, and also if you use TCP as a transport protocol. And at the same time, I also want you to achieve both these two goals, even when tenants do not cooperate with or trust one another. So let's move on to the flat addressing part. So I'm going to first talk about the simple flat addressing design. And then I'll move on to the next design where I assume that the tenants are mutually distrustful or uncooperative. So to design the proper network architecture, we first need to understand the unique challenges and opportunities of data center networking environment. So let me begin with the, some challenges. And, uh, so especially in the context of flat addressing, the key challenge is just the scale. We're talking about literally millions of virtual machines and physical machines, and their arrival and departure rates are just huge, and then at the same time, their locations and addresses can keep changing due to agility. And no existing routing protocol can handle this kind of, this kind of workload. They're simply not designed to handle this kind of workload. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're, the, the problem you're addressing is routing-related issue and not you're assuming that the switch level, yep. right, uh, the layer two level is, there's no issue with the switch. Uh, we just, the switch we just, deal with IP address. the only thing that, that we require is that the switches can somehow build their own switch level topology and then deliver packets from one switch to the other using either layer two or layer three. 
they don't need to know about the post information at all. Okay. But there is some great opportunity in the data center, center networking environment as well. So first of all, these virtual machines or physical <coughs> machines are not, of course, humans. They're not coming and going or moving around on their own. Instead, in every single cluster in a data center, there is a logically centralized cluster management system which knows everything about this server and server state. And it actually, instead of learning this state, it actually generates those state. If this cluster management system says that this VM is there or this VM is not there, even if this VM is running there, it's not there because it's not managed and then it, it will be just eventually discarded. So there is a uh, almost only uh, almost godlike system in this uh, environment. So it would be natural to take advantage of this uh, you know, almost free of charge and built-in capabilities. And the, also another benefit of this uh, cluster management system is that it can actually uh, adjust the rate and extend of server state changes. Unlike people who, you know, who will just move around at random pace from this building to the new building, these VMs are exactly coordinated. <coughs> There's another uh, key opportunity here. So whenever these VMs or servers address or location changes, that information doesn't need to be known to all the other servers instantaneously or atomically. Because networking protocols have retransmission mechanisms. They can tolerate some brief miss or lose a loss of connectivity. <coughs> so eventual consistency is fine. So these two factors give us a lot of freedom. So although it might appear that this huge amount of server state and churn can be uh, very uh, challenging, but in fact managing that information is not you know, the worst thing that you can imagine in the, in the networking world. So let me begin with this flat addressing design. The gist of this design is uh, surprisingly similar to the virtual memory uh, technology, performing virtual to physical address translation. <coughs> so here is a VL2 network. Um, each top of rack switch holds a rack of servers. And then I intentionally did not show the interconnection topology between <coughs> these switches. I just left it blank because that's just totally irrelevant for this flat addressing design. Now, these servers have virtual addresses. And exposing these virtual addresses directly inside or to the network is very bad idea. Very bad idea for a few reasons. First, there's so many of them. And second, they keep changing due to agility. And third, they're not even topologically aggregatable. So instead of exposing these virtual addresses to the network, I just let switches on their own location dependent physical addresses. Okay. Switches have physical addresses and they're aggregatable. And then I just simply run any conventional IP or even Ethernet routing protocol that maintain only the switch level topology. And this actually reduces switch routing table size significantly and also reduce the amount of routing uh, information exchange. Because even in the largest data center, the switch level topology alone is fairly stable and compact. <coughs> now, the key issue here is that these switches know how to deliver packets from one tour to another tour, but they can't deliver, they know nothing about the servers. So they cannot deliver the packets that actually use servers' virtual addresses as destinations. So that's the problem. And I solved that problem by actually introducing translation at this demarcation line. But to translate between these two addresses, I need to know about these mappings between virtual addresses and physical addresses. How do I get those? And it's actually easier because the cluster manager generates those information rather than learns it from somewhere. So what I just need is a simple directory service which can offer this mapping information when and where needed. So suppose X needs to send packets to Y and Z. It first looks up this directory service and fetch Y and Z's physical layer information or physical addresses, and then it performs encapsulation <coughs> or it prepends a, another packet header using these physical addresses as new destinations, and then simply forwards it out. And since the switches know about physical addresses, they can deliver this correctly. Okay. Now, suppose, by the way, this um, in analogy to virtual memory, this directory service is. 
like page table. And these small cache at the individual servers are like TLDs, translation leukocyte buffers. And just like translation leukocyte buffer, if there is an entry that is not used for a few short idle timeout, the servers will also evict that kind of entry. Okay. Now suppose the cluster managers somehow decide to shut down this rack for power saving, for maintenance, or for whatever reason. So the cluster manager had to actually create a replacement server of Z somewhere else, for example, under Tor 3. Now, while this cluster manager is performing that job and updating a directory service, X will forget about Z's information because preparing, re preparing a replacement server today that takes at least some tens of seconds. And then when X needs to talk to Z again, it'll relook up the directory service and get the up-to-date information about Z, and then everything will just follow on practice. Okay. So this mechanism um, is realizable with uh, low-end commodity switches. Switches need a small routing table. They don't need to exchange host information one another at all. And it also protects the network from the server state churn. So this is good, but cloud data centers need more than just flat addressing, and here is why. So for enterprise customers, using cloud data center is way, way more cost efficient, and hence they want to just migrate some of the, their existing computing infrastructure into the cloud. But they cannot move the entire infrastructure from enterprise to the cloud on a flag day. That's why we need to think about this partially cloud-based service deployment, or also known as hybrid cloud scenario. So in this scenario, corporates have their own enterprise network or enterprise data centers, and then they build another new data center, their data center or site, corporate site in the cloud. And then they connect this corporate site, new corporate site to their existing enterprise network using protected channels such as VPNs. Now, they can move the existing services from on-premise to the new site in the cloud, or they can simply create new services from scratch in the cloud. In this situation, we're facing two critical challenges. First, bring your own address space. Since IPv4 addresses are not enough, everybody is using the same reserved private address space, which is 10 slash 8. It's reserved by IETF. So everybody using and 10 slash 8, GM is using that, Thread is using that, and even this cloud provider is also using that. So if this cloud provider assigns <coughs> its own choice of IP address out of this range to this customer's VM, that IP address can actually collide with the address of another machine in that customer's on-premise network. So what this means is that customers should be able to bring their own choice of IP address into the cloud. And this also leads to some interesting problem because again, since everybody uses 10 slash 8, the customer's choices can overlap with one another. And they can also overlap with the cloud's choice as well. But why, why is this a problem? Haven't you explained that, that you have a flat L2 address space and you also virtualize IP addresses? So, I mean, having the virtual address spaces overlap shouldn't be a problem. Uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to solve. I mean, in the previous case, I assumed that addresses can move around, but I didn't assume that addresses can actually overlap. In this case, everybody is sharing exactly the same address space, so it's not that these addresses can move around freely, but they can even overlap. Yeah, I understand. So, <coughs> but I mean, you know, in virtual, you made the analogy with virtual memory, right? And in virtual memory, all yep. all, all my you know programs can be linked to the same virtual address. You're right. The, the underlying technology is actually if, it's only a problem if the physical address is involved. Yeah, the underlying underlying solution is actually very similar. We're actually building on the previous architecture. Yeah. So 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 if 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 um, within the data center, yep. If you do a web subnet, everybody is on is one subnet, right? Yep. Within the whole data set. Yep. Then in that case, everything will be done on the switch level and there's no routing level involved. Wouldn't that solve the routing issue? Um, it's just operated as one huge giant switch. Are you saying that we could have solved this problem using something like just a, on big, a, just a big VLAN? Everybody yeah, has yeah, its own exactly. VLAN and then everybody... No, but no, when, no whenever they don't need to... VLAN. The whole data set is one VLAN. But everybody... Because they want overlapping address space, everybody should 
every tenant needs at least one VLAN, its own VLAN, so that they can use their own addresses. But at some point, the physical addresses or so some physical routers will sort of, or the, all these VLANs will merge at one physical or a small number of physical routers because they have to go across the internet. And at that merging point, you'll have address overlapping problems. I thought you were trying to solve the problem within the data center. I see. It's, it's not just data center, but across, oh, yeah, okay. as well. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so each, so the, the next problem is actually reachability isolation. There are, you could actually have the same addresses, the same customer addresses everywhere, and yet a VM belonging to GM's virtual network should be able to talk to only the other VMs in the same virtual network, regardless of address overlapping. So we solved this problem using an architecture called VNet. And as I told you, this is actually building on the VL2 architecture. So in the original VL2, the demarcation between virtual and server addresses happened right underneath top of rack switches. In the cloud DC environment, tenants always get VMs, not physical machines. Okay. And, hence, and also in each physical machine, we have this uh, virtual machine switch, which is basically a software switch connecting all the VMs in that physical machine to the network. And we move this demarcation line down below the VM switch because only the VMs need virtual addresses. And the physical machines can actually have physical address, location dependent physical addresses because they're used only by the provider, not any tenants. So switches and servers use physical addresses in this architecture. Now, you can have red virtual network, and blue virtual network, and green virtual network, and you have multiple X's and Y's and Z's. That's fine, because when red X needs to talk to a red Y, the VM switch will intercept that packet and then look up the directory service, and only look up this red table, not other table, because it knows that this tenant belongs to red VNet. And the same delivery mechanism using encapsulation can deliver this packet correctly to the destination. And the destination will need to additionally confirm that, okay, this is indeed coming from a red tenant. I, I'm going to check that and then deliver it to Y. Okay. Now, if blue Z sends traffic to Y again, the same mechanism happens. Okay. Now, suppose this cluster manager decide to migrate this VM blue VM Y to a new location. So what happens is this one. So cluster manager migrates this information, so directory service now has a new information. And when this VM switch, but this VM switch, since VM migration happen, can happen actually very quickly within some hundred milliseconds or up to some seconds, this VM switch can still have this stale information. Right? This is wrong information. Y is not anymore under PM4. So, but that's fine, we can correct it because we use this simple mechanism. When this VM switch actually sends packet to the wrong location, fortunately, that PM is still alive. The VM switch is alive, and hence, it can actually tell the sender that, hey, you've got wrong information, just evict that information and then relearn. So, this VM switch will relearn the wise new location and then send that information correctly to PM3. So this way you can support VM migration. So only, only if PM2 is actually alive. If it was down, then you'd have to. Only if PM4 was down. PM4 yes. Today. But if PM4 was physically down, there is no point of VM migration anyway. You lost your ongoing connections. VM migration <coughs> won't help you anyway. You might be recovering from a snapshot. Yeah. Cool. yeah if you had snapshot. Yeah, you might be recovering. But there I mean, generally, some small you gaps. When a system, yeah. yeah, when a system goes yeah. down, you might recover from it. Yep. Then you'd send to it. And you, you wouldn't be able to detect on use until you actually timed out. Yep. So for the sake of time, can we keep questions for the end? Sorry. So, yeah. this design is great, but if there is one component in this design that makes me just stay up late at night, it's the directory service. So directory service fails, no new connection. Everything almost stops. Huge correlated failure. So, um, but there is one, one nice thing that we can take advantage of which is the eventual consistency. We don't need complete atomic update. So we use this loosely coupled distributed system idea, which is similar to Google's you know, distributed lock service, such as Chubby. So basically, we have two-tier design, a large <coughs> number of read-optimized <coughs> cache servers, 
and a small number of write optimized master servers. And between these two layers, I use loose synchronization protocol. And these servers are actually <coughs> implemented as software and they run in regular VM. So if I need to spin up more number of these servers, I can just easily do that on demand and hence I can meet the you know, increasing workload of the directory service. <laughs> so in production, we use five master servers and some 60 cache servers to cover about 100 million VMs. And um, did you have some questions? Oh, sorry. I have okay. a question. Yep. You talk about directory servers. Yep. Are you aware of any work that is being done towards enhancing DNS DHCP to incorporate some of the functions that you want to include in your directory? Yeah, yeah. Actually, this kind of indirection can happen at the DNS level. We're doing it at the IP and Ethernet layer. We're using ARP. But you can exactly do the same thing between host names and IP addresses. But the thing is that host names are not as universal as IP addresses. Sometimes customers still hard code their IP addresses. <coughs> So um, to incorporate or to enable address <laughs> resolution and translation, I have to modify the server networking stack. And uh, encapsulation introduced some some core kernel cases problems, which uh, you know make the servers might not be able to run at full 10 Gbps line rate. So we had to modify that you know, uh, traffic spreading mechanism uh, that actually spreads 10 Gbps of traffic volume over multiple CPU cores. And uh, this is a better release, actually, and then there are some thousands of customers, enterprise customers, using this feature today. And um, uh, let's skip that part. So now let's move on to the second part, predictable and uniform high capacity. So again, let me begin with some key challenges and opportunities. So this is the challenge slide. And uh, one of the key challenges is related to traffic patterns. And uh, a traffic pattern is basically a mathematical descriptor describing how these servers in a network talk to one another. And why do I care about it? Because if I know the traffic patterns, I can optimize the routing topology and routing scheme to best serve that particular traffic pattern. It's basically the biggest bang for buck approach. And to understand that, actually, I instrumented a large data mining cluster composed of more than 1,500 servers, and then uh, derived distinctive traffic patterns using some well-known uh, machine learning technologies. And the observations were very surprising. First, even from a, uh, the traffic measurement results of one single day, I was able to identify more than 100 unique traffic patterns. And then, those patterns were you know, quite different from one another. And second, those traffic patterns change it frequently, and then when they change, they do it in an unpredictable fashion. And these findings were just uh, you know, immediately ringing an alarm bell in my, mile, in my mind, because these are so different from what networking researchers have seen other types of big networks, such as ISP backbones. In ISP backbones, if you do the same kind of analogy, in a single day, you would see less than a handful number of distinctive traffic patterns. And then they repeat every single day. There is a very strong diurnal pattern. In data centers, that kind of regularity is very, very weak. So what does it mean? It means that if you are to optimize routing to avoid hotspots, then you better do that very frequently and rapidly. Otherwise, the efficacy of that optimization might not be great. <coughs> but fortunately, there are some great opportunities as well. Uh, these opportunities are related to uh, the characteristics of traffic flows or TCP or UDP connections. And again, why do we care about it? Because to avoid hotspots, networking mechanisms always employ some traffic spreading mechanisms. And then the unit of traffic spreading is always connection. Otherwise, you would end up causing out of delivery, right? So, according to the same traffic measurement wizard I just mentioned, for more than half of the time, each server communicates with at least 10 other servers and sometimes up to 100 servers. So, that means there are so many concurrent flows in a data center. And at the same time, more than 99% of all flows terminate within a second. So what that means is that these flows, this large number of flows are actually quite small. And even if you want to deliver like 100 megabytes of chunk, 
the 10 Gbps network, it'll definitely you know, terminate within one second, because it's just so fast. And this also agrees with other you know, researchers' recent measurement uh, data published in some uh, top-notch conferences. At the same time, there's another great opportunity. First of all, to avoid cache miss problem, modern operating systems pin a connection to a particular CPU core. And then that CPU core today usually cannot put or receive more than 3 to 4. 2, 3 is a little old, but 3 to 4 GBPS today. And then modern CPUs scale by increasing the number of cores rather than making individual core fast. So I would expect that this kind of behavior or a pattern would last at least for quite a while. At the same time, the network links between switches are way better than this. There are at least 10G today, 40 GBPS maybe next year, and 100G in a couple years. So what does this mean? Let me give you an analogy. The flows are balls and links are bins. And when you have large number of small balls, and when you have a small number of relatively large bins, just throwing these balls randomly to these bins might not fall too much behind optimal spreading. So what that means is that simple probabilistic traffic spreading might work well enough in data centers. And we're actually taking advantage of this factor. Now, with these observations in mind, let's move on to the solution space. So our charge is building a network that doesn't have any bottleneck under any traffic pattern. Okay. So, but what, what, what do I mean by this any traffic pattern? And to define that mathematically, I borrow this notion of host model. So, since this is centered, I, I presume that a lot of people are quite familiar with value load balancing and the host model. Okay. So, um, host model just enforces this one simple constraint. Okay. What it means is that the amount of traffic leaving all these senders to a particular destination, the sum of that is not larger than the is receiver's network attachment capacity. Okay. And um, why do I need this simple rule? Because if you don't have this, in-network congestion is inevitable. Suppose everybody sends the full stream of C, capacity C, to this single destination J. Then you will have severe network drops at this location. Right? So you think network congestion is in inevitable. So by simply you know, requiring only this single constraint, the host model actually presents the most lenient traffic model that is admissible. And, and to, to explain this in plain English, what this means is that senders do not send more than receivers can draw from the network. Okay? And here's another interesting observation. TCP actually enforces the host model. So why is it so? Let me talk about another example again using J. So suppose J's network attachment capacity is C, and the whole volume arriving at J will not exceed beyond C because the TCP stack, if all these connections were TCP, the TCP stack will enforce that naturally. And then that admission control is done by the TCP stack at the senders, not somewhere in the network or not in front of J or not in the J. So that's precisely the host model. Now, but still remember that host model is very lenient, so if you don't have good network topology or routing, you can still have in-network congestion. For example, this one. Suppose you have this topology and the traffic demand between these four nodes are this way. So suppose you're doing shortest path routing, they'll both take this path, and if this link is, you know, has less than 2C of capacity, you'll still have in-network congestion. So what this means is that you need good topology and good routing scheme. And what are good topology and good routing scheme? So here is an ideal good topology and good routing scheme, which is post, uh, full mesh topology plus Bailey load balancing. So Bailey load balancing basically uh, was proposed in the early 80s uh, for a mechanism for parallel, communica parallel processor communication on a hypercube topology. Uh, researchers had recently looked into this problem or this mechanism for the on-chip communication and also for uh, internet wide area communication and Professor McCune here especially worked on the latter part. And I, my, my research is first at uh, using this theory for uh, data center network. So 
again, VLB assumes that we have this full mesh topology. And suppose this server I needs to talk to send some amount of traffic to this server 6. Instead of sending this directly to from 1 to 6, VLB first spreads this traffic evenly over all the other servers. And then each of these intermediate servers then forwards that traffic down to the final destination. So this indirection is the signature of value and load balancing. And if you keep doing this for every single connection, then you have some great effect. VLB actually mathematically proves that once you do this, you don't have any in-network congestion at all inside this network. And the proof of this is relatively straightforward, so I'll be happy to talk about this offline. But this, this VLB theory is really, really beautiful, especially in the context of data center networking. There are many, many good reasons. First of all, this interaction is very, very cheap in data center. It introduces just a few microseconds of latency increase, which is negligible in data center. And second, data center network topology in, is just very regular, if not full mesh. So we can easily implement VLB, unlike wide area network. And at the same time, this, uh, the theory of VLB ensures that uh, the, when you do this, the network is not just free of bottleneck, but the link capacity on this full mesh topology is also minimized down to 2C over N. So what this means is that if you increase the data center size by having more number of ser servers, you increase <coughs> N. That means your link capacity actually can go down. That's another beautiful part. And finally, this also shows the power of randomized algorithm, treating any cases just like even best and worst case, just like average case, ensuring predictable performance even when the input traffic is totally unpredictable, which is exactly the case in a data center. So now the question is, how can you realize this in practice? And here is the topology that we propose. Basically, it's a, an adaptation of closed network topology. And closed network topology has been there for about a half century now. We, we call this a close, uh, folded closed topology. So in addition to um, coming up with this full mesh topology between these top of racks, which is I first try to reduce the number of switches just by aggregating or introducing another layer called aggregation. Basically what it does is it just hosts many number, each aggregation switch hosts many number of tours without introducing any oversubscription at this layer. I just wanted to reduce the number of switches so that I can make something like close easily. Now, if I wanted to come up with a full mesh topology, I have one problem. The problem is that the number of aggregation switches should be identical to the number of ports, I.O. ports on this aggregation switch. But that's a bad requirement because when you have a big network, you also need incrementally big network switch. And there is only certain kinds of switch that you can buy right now, right? So to avoid that problem, we use this folded closed topology. Basically, the signature is this full viper type mesh. And then what it introduces is these two separate <coughs> parameters. K and D. K is the number of aggregation switches, and D is the number of ports on each aggregation switch. And the key idea here is that these two can differ now. So we can build a big network using a small D uh, device. And in fact, just, just for simplicity, suppose D and K are identical. This is the device that are available that right now. And then with this kind of device, you can build fully non-oversubscribed network for up to 20,000 servers with this kind of device which will become available very soon you can go all the way up to 200,000 servers without any oversubscription now finally how does uh, VLB and this new topology work together so let me suppose there is some traffic demand from T2 to T5 let me remind you the key principle of VLB the key principle is just spread traffic in a destination independent fashion over all this possible path. And how do I achieve this without introducing any new hardware solutions or some funky mechanisms in the switches? Uh, fortunately, I didn't have to introduce anything because IP networking technology already has something called ECMP, Equal Cost Multipath Forwarding. What it does is this. When a router has multiple equidistant paths to the same destination, the router actually chooses a next hub for this packet in a 
in a deterministic fashion. And then it actually chooses different next up for different connections. And the specific mechanism is actually taking the hash of five tuple values so that all the packets in a connection can take at least one single path. But for different <coughs> connections, it uses different next hops. So that's very similar to traffic spreading, if not ideal traffic spreading. And thanks to this topology, pick any two top of break switches, we have large number of equidistant paths naturally. And those paths do not actually introduce any indirection. Any path will always take this path. So this traffic volume will be naturally spread among all these paths. Now the key question is, of course, how close is this to the ideal case? There are some cases where we actually fall short of the ideal VLB. First, we're doing random assignment, not round robin. And second, flows are not identical in terms of sizes. If we did, maybe byte by byte or packet by packet round robin, it might be really close to VLB, but we're doing per connection random spreading. So there will be some suboptimality, and then I'll quantify that in the next slide. This mechanism harnesses huge aggregate capacity in this network without introducing any esoteric traffic routing, uh, routing optimization or relying on new you know, hardware functionalities in the, in the physical switch hops. And it also ensures robustness <coughs> to failures because you have many active paths, and it works well with switch mechanisms available today. So finally, this is what I have built about three years ago. Um, basically, some 80 servers interconnected through the closed <coughs> network topology. And uh, as you can see, everything is you know, perfectly unprofessionally wired. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'd really love to show you how neat and clean all these things are in production network. But unfortunately, I can't share any pictures of our production data centers. So. Um, Really, we do have this now, and then this is way bigger. This is not just a standard architecture for Windows Azure, but this is common for all big divisions in Microsoft. And um, we built, along with my colleagues, we built these networks in all the data centers we have around the world. And the smallest one has more than 60 terabps of capacity. And uh, the, over, the worst case oversubscription ratio is two to one. And uh, each network, uh, each server has 10 GBPS of network attachment. So with that, um, the each net, each server has a network I/O throughput larger, actually surpassing the uh, disk I/O throughput. So each server can actually send, even in the worst case, more than 600 megabytes per second, which is larger than the theoretical maximum of SETA 2.0. Now um, we use basically just IP routing in the switches. And hence, we can actually build this using any pizza box switches. And uh, we actually did that. So the cost saving, given the target capacity of say 62 terabps, if you compare the cost of building that network using this design, that and with that of the old design, then we actually save more than 96% of the cost. So reality check. I just wanted to validate how closely this network, you know, follows the theory of VLB. So I ran some auto old traffic shuffle tests using 75 servers because that's the most challenging <coughs> task for network. And then this chart actually shows the, um, the actual aggregate good put value over the 400 seconds, uh, and then this test actually ran 400 seconds. And the aggregate good put value is actually the sum of the bytes that are actually delivered to the application across all 75 servers. And to compare this with the ideal case, I actually plotted this theoretical maximum of VLB. If everything worked just perfectly fine, you would see this aggregate curve and then dropping all at the same time at this moment. And as you can see, VLB actually is quite close to the theoretical maximum. It's actually 94% of that theoretical maximum. But I wanted to focus on this 6% suboptimality. Why is this happening? First of all, as I told you, we're doing per, per flow random spreading. That can introduce some suboptimality. 
And also, to enforce the host model, we were using TCP, and TCP is not perfect. It's great enough, but it's not perfect, because it takes some round time, it does, you know, so to pattern, it also introduces some packet loss to actually find the right rate. So th there are some reasons here, but I believe that TCP is good enough, and I didn't want to further improve TCP, I just wanted to see what this, you know, flow level random spreading uh, effects to this suboptimality. So I actually went into the, our production system and looked at the link utilization because if there is any suboptimality, it will manifest itself as some link <coughs> utilization being higher than others. So I looked at, I collected this link utilization statics from the production network over a whole week and this is per minute uh, link utilization and that's actually 50 to 80 percent depending on the workload over the week. And the standard deviation of link utilization measured separately at every single minute was just less than 1.5 percentage point, meaning that link utilization is quite even. And hence, we can you know, confirm that we have to approximate BLB in, even in production fairly well. But on the previous slide, you made it look like some stragglers got hit hard as opposed to kind of uniformly spreading. The this one? Works. This bump? Yeah. That was in cast. What? That was in cast. TCP in case. We're using not DC TCP or something like that. Because they're all bursting together and then some got just damaged. Great point though. Is that one, is that one and a half percent uh, uh, variation? Is that across links or within a minute and one minute? Across all links. Across all links. <coughs> I have a question. Yep. There's a lot of work that has been done here yep. you know, characterizing elephant flows and mice flows. Yep. In service provider. Yep. Is your data available to characterize that traffic in data centers as well? Because the nature of the yep. traffic is also changing? Yeah. Did you look yeah, yeah. Um, some of that actually is available. So I'll, I'll contact the owners of those data and then get back to you. And yeah, um, I think the nature is changing, especially in data center, because it's not generated by human. It's just totally generated by some, some code. And then the application you know, programmers are fully aware that if I generate huge elephant flows, I'll get some serious issues in data centers. They actually... Or a lot of mice yeah. flows could cause a lot of problems too. Yeah, that too. And yep. in your design, did you look at the size of the buffer that you need at the NICs? Yes. Because you are driven by the source. Yes. Sort of, yes. To manage your craft? Uh, yes. But I... I, I are you talking about TCP socket buffer or the actual NIC hardware buffer? I'm saying NIC hardware buffer for the for simplicity. Uh, okay. See. Okay. Um, can you take this yeah, question offline so that I can? Add? Yes. Um, so about the one point five percent deviation. Yeah. Um, so that's for so one minute. Bins. Yeah, at every single minute, I compare between the link utilization of all yeah, values in that. So, so you know, given that um, the majority of data center flows say last less than a second. Yep. Um, Good point. What the? I mean, if you're trying to measure and balance and really quantify how much it affects true performance, you probably need to go down to the level of say. You know, I definitely agree. Yeah, it's just uh, the artifact of not having you know fine grain measurement in the process. Do you have um, so you have any insight? What, what do you expect? But at the same time, you also looked at at least the um, tail drop, the com you know how many packet drops have happened on this particular network. We also enabled ECN on every single hub to see actually ECN marked packets happen frequently. Those things look quite clean. So we, I have pretty strong confidence that the, the, you know, the transient oversubscription that lasts less than a few milliseconds is not happening frequently at all in this network. One question. Yes. <coughs> have you analyzed how NPTCP might affect this? Will this improve the performance further? Could you remind me of what NPTCP? Multipath TCP. Um, so uh, you could actually employ multipath TCP on this topology because you indeed have multi a lot of multipath. Um, uh, you could embed <coughs> that. Um, no, I would say that it's a, a very applicable approach here. 
but one other thing that I want to mention there is that um, MPTCP wanted to take advantage of sort of resource pooling. Because if I use, if I can use multiple paths, I, I can actually get more bandwidth. In this case, that benefit might not be present because your network capacity is essentially bound by your NIC capacity. So no matter how many TCP connections you use, each of which use different path, your, your ECMP is already doing that. Not at the connection level, but multiple connections level. Right? So that, that benefit might not be used in this architecture. So um, I just wanted to, this is the last slide before the conclusion. So network virtualization is comparable to other key network virtualization technologies such as virtual memory because it, it meets the key principles of net, any virtualization technology, abstraction, isolation, and efficiency. So I, let me just go fast on this slide. So abstraction, what is the abstraction of network virtualization? Location independent addressing and uniform high capacity. Basically, the physicality does not matter. That's the abstraction. And isolation, reachability isolation, address space isolation, and performance isolation. That's the key feature of network virtualization. Efficiency. As if you know, virtual memory hosts multiple process sharing exactly the same virtual address spaces, we also ensure that concurrency of virtual networks using a feature called bring your own addresses. So all these actually improves the agility in the data center significantly. So, network virtualization enables agility, meaning that providers and tenants can use any available servers anytime in the data center. And um, network virtualization is comparable to virtual memory or machine virtualization, storage virtualization. And uh, I have also shown you that turning these high-level architectures into operational systems is quite possible when your focus is on first simple solution and intuitive abstraction. And the intuitive abstraction that we're proposing here is basically huge virtual switch. And this virtual switch gives you flat addressing and predictably and uniformly high performance. And, and essentially, I also turned this into individual huge virtual switch dedicated only to a particular tenant. So with all that said, I'll be happy to take more questions. Thank you. We have time for two questions. Otherwise, uh, the rest you have to take it offline. Okay. okay. <coughs> so, uh, service providers have implemented similar virtualization using layer three DPM. This is very similar to layer yes. three DPM. Right? Yes. So, yes. if this technology were to be applied in service provider networks, what what are the big issues that you see? Um. So, at least in terms of the capability of coming up, say something like VRF, virtual routing and forwarding, which allows routing protocols to disseminate over webcam address ranges, it's similar. But those kind of protocols do not address address assignment, address resolution, and those mechanisms. For example, when you di disseminate this information, you're obviously talking about two or three orders of magnitude more, more amount of routing information, because everything is here per host, not per aggregate or per prefix. And hence, when you disseminate it, you don't want to just randomly disseminate using something like EBGP, full mesh, or route reflector. That's not going to scale at all. So you need you have the directory to yes. take care of that. Yes. Of that. Uh, yes. Any other uh, issues that you see? Uh, address allocation and address resolution is the other problem. The existing weekends uh, technologies do not care about those parts. They only care about coming up with multiple VRFs and then synchronizing those VRFs. Like DHCP, intercepting DHCP and ARP and all those things. Any? Yeah. Yes. So, <coughs> how much can you uh, give an estimate of like you know how much uh, sort of how many additional switches you need with the uh, folded cloths versus traditional fat tree, and also how much is the core traffic increased by VLB versus not using VLB? Um. So. Uh, let me try to understand your question. Were you trying to compare between this architecture and fat tree or? Yeah, so I mean, I think the folded clause looks like a fat tree with more aggregation switches mainly. Uh, yes. Do, and uh, also, VLB requires sort of kind of two trips through the core for potentially yeah, for, for every, for every packet. Yes. So, so my question, I guess, is you know, how much more hardware do you need with, it, with this versus a traditional data center network design? You um, basically, 
as you go up at each layer, you still need exactly the same amount of full bisection bandwidth. If, if the aggregate of, suppose you have n number of servers each with C, you have n C capacity, that has to be preserved at every layer, unless you are actually willing to introduce some small oversubscription. So uh, th definitely the number of switches uh, and links increase, uh, but I think that's just natural cost of offering more, <coughs> more bandwidth. Um, between this topology and FAT3, the UCSD folks, I don't actually see much difference. Uh, they're also using multi-rooted tree, and the, the, as you go up to the level, you, you, have, you still have you know, many mesh edges as well. So I don't think there's some fundamental difference between these two. Let's thank Sang again.